I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends Podcast, the podcast designed to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. With me today is Richard Chase. Now, Richard's been on the podcast a few times. He is from the Lower Limb Clinic in Melbourne. So, Richard, how are you doing today? So far, so good. It's about four o'clock. Uh... <laughs> so far, so good. There's heaps of the day to go. Ah, uh, yes. What could possibly uh... go wrong after 4 p.m.? It's funny you say that because just before we started recording this, there was a guy who decided that this was the time that he was going to start mowing the lawn right outside my window. I don't know. <laughs> Day's not over yet. I know. I find that because I do most of these recordings, nearly all my recordings from my home office. And yeah, a lot of times my neighbor does not get the memo to don't whip a snip while I'm in the middle of uh, doing a podcast. And it has happened. Or an aeroplane will go over. Every now and then we get helicopters that fly really low over a house, emergency helicopters. Does your neighbour like you? Because nobody cuts the grass three times a week. But... Yeah, I know. I know. He must see that. Oh, he's in the office again. I've just seen him put the air con on. He must yeah. be doing a recording. That's going to annoy the crap out of him. It's probably plastic grass. Actually, it might be. But the lawn always looks really good, I must admit. So no, anyway, you. today, this recording, what we're doing today, came off the back of a video that I did about builders and destroyers. We're not necessarily going to talk about that because I'm going to do a, a second video, builders and destroyers part two, the Klingon. So people can pay attention to that one. This is, <laughs> this is a funny story attached to that. But we're, we're going to talk about some other things that sort of relate to that particular topic, but different. I reckon it's a good idea because we, I remember just after you did the other video, you and I had a sort of a, a Facebook voice chat yeah. because I was thinking about it. There, there are some people who are out there and I think that they're, they just, well, you, you get siloed in the people that you work with and it's very unusual to go out and maybe chat to another podiatrist. You get so excited when you finally meet one at a, at a barbecue because everyone else is a lawyer or an accountant or something and there's no one to talk to. That's true. But the, the thing is that, there was a concept that I was reading about a while ago, which I think we talked about called the worthy rival, which is somewhere someone who teaches you how to do stuff which maybe you're also doing, but they're not a competitor. They're just they're, they're working in the same space and you can learn from them and you can give moral support to one another without having the need to compete. You don't have to you don't have to somehow win the whole practicing because you're going to be practicing for a long time. There's no winner, mm. there's no loser. And for some reason, we missed the memo on that as well. So a lot of podiatrists, I think, just in my observation, somehow feel like if I'm getting work, then you're missing out on it. Or if you're getting it, that it would have come to me if you didn't get it, which is frankly garbage. But I think it's a mentality of scarcity instead of yeah. abundance. Whereas I saw a quote and somebody said, she came with abundance, she took abundance and left abundance. Amazing. And, and when they first said it, I went, oh, that was really interesting. And, and I just thought, what a great attitude, though. She yeah. came with abundance, she took abundance, but left abundance. Yeah, and I'm well, thinking, that's how life should be. It shouldn't be, oh, she took something, therefore there's, there's only a limited amount left. I agree. I, I was thinking the way life is at the moment. Some people are applauded wherever they go, others whenever they go. What was that quote you said before? Yeah, if a leader doesn't have followers, he's just oh, going yeah. for a walk. Basically, yes. <laughs> so, so if anyone listening, we have a bit of a preamble before this as well. Uh, uh, it's been a while. But uh, no, I think so. one of the guys I like to read is a guy called Simon Sinek. You've probably seen his TED Talk, the sort of the start with why stuff. Yeah. And there's another guy who does that sort of thing called Adam Grant. He's a professor of, I think, business psychology in the States. And the – it was great. Like Simon Sinek has got about five books out at the moment, and he would always check how they were going on Amazon, and he'd feel really good about himself. And then he'd check how Adams were going, and he'd go, I don't feel so good now. And he, he'd do a talk, and it'd be really well received. Then he'd see Adam do a talk, and he'd go, yeah, just something about that guy. Now, they didn't know each other, and they were on one day they were speaking at the same event, and the host thought it would be fun if they introduced each other. So he got up, and he said directly to Adam Grant, you make me feel really intimidated. 
because I wish I could speak as easily as you and I wish I could quote the breadth and the depth of research that you quote just off the cuff. And every time I see you doing things, I somehow feel like I'm not as good because I compare myself to you. And I just, I don't feel like I'm hitting the mark the way that you are. And Adam Grant looked at him and said, I feel exactly the same about you. It's and funny, isn't so it? it is. And the, and so they were writing about this talk, and they've they've actually done a bunch of podcasts together. And they were talking about the idea of the worthy rivals and how business keeps going forever and practice keeps going forever. I saw a line in a book once. There was a chapter title saying, "If you think you're indispensable, check your appointment book a week after you're dead." And you, you, <laughs> yeah. you pretty quickly figure out that there will always be people going to podiatrists, and when you're not there, somebody will have replaced you, or any health profession. So, and I, I've said that to coaching clients. When I'll go, look, this is what you do this, this, and this with your appointment book. This is how we can change things, get yeah. more of the patients you like, less of what you don't like. And they go, oh, no, but I, I couldn't do that because my patients want to see me. And I go, okay, that's fine. I said, but if you have a heart attack tomorrow and drop dead, mm -hmm. you're going to see somebody else. So you just have to accept the fact that they don't all want to see you. They might, if they had a choice between you and Bob, they might want you, but they're quite prepared to see Bob if that's yeah. the only option they have. Yeah. It was funny because when I first started getting associates, sometimes I'd, I'd, we call it transfer of trust, but another word for that is handball. Um, and I would I would sometimes get them to see the associate instead. And then occasionally they'd prefer them to me. And I thought, hang on a second. And then I thought, but that's actually what I want. Yeah. You spend so much time feeling like you're indispensable and no one can do it quite like you do. And then all of a sudden they see somebody else in your practice and you've got this time and you're going, I actually don't know how to use it now. What am I supposed to do with it? <laughs> it doesn't happen for long, but when it does happen, it's a strange revelation. So with Worthy Rivals, was this a book that they wrote together? Yeah. Or? Oh, no. So Simon Sinek wrote a book called The Infinite Game, which I think was built on the work of Dr. James Scars. And it was essentially talking about the idea that there would be people that you could, that you would always be working in the same area as, and, you could use them instead of competing with them, you could learn from them because there's no winner declared at the end of business. Like you don't get to the yeah. end of the end and go, I made this much and I saw this many patients, therefore I'm put out press number three. Um, it, <laughs> yeah, I know what you yeah, mean. You it, don't get a trophy at the end of the year no, and you go, number one podiatrist in Cairns. You can get the coffee mug, but I think they're on yeah. Amazon. But so the, so it's, and, Essentially, the what it does, and I think what I was talking about the other day was wanting to change the mindset of anyone who might be listening to, instead of saying, "Oh, who do they think they are?" because they're such a big, they think they're so great, but really, because let's face it, you only see the things that went wrong with your com with the competition. Because if they're happy, they tend not to come to you. They go, they keep going where they're going, yeah. unless it's been so long between orthotics that they forgot where they went, which does happen. Oh, so it does. <laughs> um, what you could actually do is completely flip the mindset and go, oh, look, there's seven podiatry clinics around here. Um, they're doing quite well. I wonder what they're doing. Maybe I can learn something from it. In fact, maybe, given that it's so lonely treating patients sitting in a room by yourself, maybe I could just give them a call and say, hey, no agenda here. Let's grab a cup of coffee. Let's have it. I mean, I was at a, two years ago, I was at a conference in Lawn. And there's a bunch of podiatrists down the road from me, literally about a seven-minute walk. And I bumped into one of them. I never met him before. He knew exactly who I was. He said, hey, let's go sit. And he introduced me to his whole team. And we all stayed together. And we we're all mates at the conference, if you're listening. Thanks for that. It was it was just a bunch of people who said, look, we're at a conference. There's no reason to be standoffish just because we work close to each other. There's enough people that hate each other. We don't have to be like that. Mm. And what we took away from it was like, they said, oh, do you do any coaching? Yeah, I do this. What about you? Yeah, we tried that. We moved on to this. And do you use this? No, I use PraxSuite or Clinical, whatever they happen to be on. And so you just start shooting the breeze. And you pretty quickly figure out that everyone has the same problems. Everyone has the same wins and the same challenges. And what you can do is flip it so that I will look better if you do a good job and people associate me with you and oh, vice hell versa. Yeah. yeah. And like people go, oh, I saw Tyson. He did a great job. Now I live in Melbourne. Okay, great. I know Tyson. He's an awesome guy. And I do a good job. And then we both look better. And then the next person, they go, he's a podiatrist. He must know his stuff. Yeah, well, I know. It's, like you said before, everybody's had a patient come in with somebody else's orthotics and say, oh, I got these orthotics. And they're so quick to say, oh, yeah, they're rubbish. They don't know what they're doing. I do. 
Yeah, who cuts and, your hair? Like, yeah. yeah, and every, everyone's heard those sort of stories. But, yeah, I think if we can all try, if we can all lift each other up and make every, each, if we can make each other better in, and, and do it in a positive way, yeah. then we're all going to benefit long term. The other thing is that there is a certain global consciousness for any profession. And if you are identified with a bunch of people who are very insecure within themselves, the kind of people that tear you down, like the destroyers you were talking about in the video. Yeah. If you have a bunch of people who have the option to not comment on something, which has really got nothing to do with them, like somebody else's advert. It must have happened to you. It's happened to me plenty of times on, <laughs> on social media where we have a, a a video advertising something and somebody will come on and go wear gloves or you're not a doctor or some rubbish like that i'm going you had two options and one of them was just to not say anything and instead here you are like you can respond and make you look silly because that's what you're doing to yourself but why do i need to participate um, yeah it was funny one of the when yeah about the <clears throat> builders and destroyers and i went back i went through the feed on a particular facebook group and I looked at different times the, the destroyers had made a comment on something that, yeah, some of it, like I was saying, some of the stuff that they post is good stuff. Some of it is delivered in a fantastic way. Some of the articles that they attach to it are great articles, but sometimes the tone is awful. Yeah. So I sent messages individually to all the people who'd done the original post and asked them, how did you feel when the destroyer made this comment or posted this thing and then the people that then commented on their comments afterwards I'll tell you some of the things that people said to me i was just like it's just mm. so sad that was... if their intention was to upset the person to mm. make them feel small to ridicule yeah. them then that then they did the job then they should be wearing yeah. their destroyer badge, a badge oh, on it because hey look what i did not only did i prove how smart i am mm. i also made the other people feel small would you do it in public in no, a room with people though because there's a guy there's a guy john ronson he writes a whole lot of books like say you've been publicly shamed and so and he said lynch mobs these days happen in a matter of half an hour across the world and they it makes us feel good about ourselves to just destroy people because they deserved it did they really Monica, Monica Lewinsky has been the butt of jokes for 25 years now but yeah. for a year and a half her mother wouldn't let her shower by herself she was terrified of what would happen. We destroy people. And the thing about it is it's not just about making us a better profession and not destroying people and damaging them. But in reality, people don't fake being depressed. They fake being okay. You can really mm. damage people with that sort of stuff. And the, the truth is there was actually no reason to comment at all. You don't like it? Fine. How is it? I'm working my guts out here. How is it you even have the time to go and troll other people's Facebook posts and then make comments on that? Like, well, there, that there was one. There was one comment in particular that <laughs> I saw it and I just shook my head. And one of them was the person asked a question about creating a was it? reconstructing a toenail, doing a toenail reconstruction, and then the person commented and said. Yeah, not to be pedantic, but it's really a prosthesis, not a reconstruction. Okay. And, and then commented after okay, that. Okay, so, so look, as someone who, who actually has a prosthetics degree, I'm just going to jump on the who cares. That, that's exactly what I thought. When I saw that, I went, seriously, everything do you like else how you I wrote, put my Do you like how I put my credentials out there first? Yeah, I, I, I like that. It was good, yeah. That's right. But just one didn't know how important I am there. Anyway, <laughs> so sorry, what were, you, what were you saying? No, but I just, I, I, I read that and I went, Okay, the rest of what they said afterwards made sense about like, they actually gave decent advice. Hmm. But I thought, but their opening comment was just was unnecessary. We all knew what the person meant. Yes, technically they were correct about hmm. being a, a prosthetic, but it was unnecessary yeah. to actually put that there. As I was reading a book a while ago where it was called The Hard Thing About Hard Things, I think. Or maybe, oh no, it's Mike Horowitz, it may have been his other one, but what you do is who you are. It's, so one of his one of his vice presidents once said, look, I'm really not comfortable with phrasing the information the way we're doing it. He said, one night he said, because we're telling people that something which is true in a way that what they hear is false. And look, there's probably a certain amount of collateral damage where people go, I want to help, but I just don't have the social skills to do it in a way where it's not going to do damage by virtue of how I deliver the message. 
and maybe that's something maybe we all maybe there needs to be almost like a, a delay before the post goes live so you can go actually you know what i want to just edit that before anyone sees it and maybe that will maybe we need a time delay but i think it's this could be a very campfire song and kumbaya and let's build a profession and all feel good about ourselves and be yeah. happy but in but reality i think We can, absolutely, but I think the first step is to really just stop eating our young. Somebody posted that. They were renowned for just – I think that was one of the comments they yeah. posted on my video that podiatry is renowned for eating the young, but I don't think it's just podiatry. Yeah. Well, this is actually a time-critical thing because, I mean, like the average working life of a physiotherapist is seven years, and that means they study for four years, and then by seven they're doing something else. Oh, and right. when you Didn't consider the number of people that are working in the profession 20 or 30 years later, that means that it's actually probably a lot shorter for many people. And when a different 21% of people in the most recent APRA survey said they're not going to be in the profession in Australia in five years' time, that's a crisis. That's losing mm. a fifth of our profession when we've got a huge drop in numbers coming out. So we actually need to protect each other. We need to build each other up. And we need to actually own the foot to the degree where people go, I want to go and see a podiatrist because I rolled my ankle. I'm not going to go to the physio or the myo or whoever else. And in order to do that, we've got to have people who say, you know what, I'm going to stand by what I do and, and back myself, which I know we did another podcast on. But let's actually get people to to want to stay in podiatry. And the only way to do that is if you feel that you get something out of it apart from just a paycheck and being able to use fancy tools. Uh, I think you've got to be able to ask questions. But like I remember talking to somebody else and they said, yeah, sometimes some of the questions that are asked on social media shouldn't be asked. They, they should know that information. Yeah. If they don't know, they should have a podiatry friend that they can go and ask and don't post it on an open forum because sometimes some of them yeah. are just yeah. opening themselves yeah. up for people it's, to comment. It's that guy anonymous. He does that all the time. But yeah. <laughs> I, I think also the I think people don't look enough at the idea of having a mentor. And there are the two elements that that they don't mm. consider. One being that a mentor is not going to be the person you go to for everything. You'll have some people where you go to and say, look, I'm not sure what I'm looking at here, but I'm worried it could be something serious. And then you have some people where you go to and you say, look, it's pretty quiet. How do I drum up business? And so there are mentors for different areas of what you do. Yeah. But the other thing is that, and this is something which should be accepted in both directions by the person mentoring as well, that there will come a time when they don't necessarily need you for that because their needs will change as well. And it might be that you know how to do that, which is the whole idea. But what you need to know now is something about branding or you need someone who you can just talk to for peer support or something. And so the nature of what you need will change and the nature of what you get as a result will also change. But you should have a couple of people that you can just bring up and have a relationship with where you say, hey, how's it going? Look, um, and someone says, yeah, actually a bit down this week. A lot of the patients are very sort of full moony, that, that kind of thing. So you, because you don't actually have to do it alone. And look, I'm sitting here, the only podiatrist in the office today. There'd be a lot of clinics that are just like that. But you have a good day or you have a bad day, you want to share it with someone. Mm. And if you have a question, you want to be able to feel safe that you can ask somebody without being talked down to. Because firstly, you're not going to learn. And secondly, you're not going to ask it again if you ask anything again. But if someone feels they can contact you, the chances are they probably won't need to contact you that often. But when they do, it'll be a meaningful thing. And the whole nature of a relationship is that if you can reach out to somebody and you feel protected, you'll come away with a bit of a buzz. You'll both come away having learned something about the other person and about yourself. You'll come away having felt that the other person knows something and that you know something. Like You come away thinking like, hey, I want to do that again. That was cool. And it's the exact opposite as well. If if they slay me down, you're not going to want to repeat the experience. Why would you? But oh, your patients will also suffer because you won't know that thing. So. Yeah, I used to say that there's no – asking a silly question, there's nothing wrong with asking a silly question. It's sometimes it's like not asking – but it's not – I would rather like a, a podiatrist that used to work for me come and ask me a question on something, no matter how silly they thought it was, hmm. because – if they don't ask it and they're doing the wrong thing, that looks even worse to be doing the wrong thing. So they're better to ask the question than not do it. So in a social situation, like on Facebook, if in doubt, like you said, 
you should have some mentors in your life that you can maybe reach out to first, ask those questions. And then if you've still got questions, then post that. Go, hey, I spoke to a few people. This is the information I've got. What's now? Let's get an open forum opinion on that and then actually get the feedback. So I thought now would be a perfect time to just dive in and remind everybody that if you're looking or considering a podiatry business coach, before you reach out to some of the larger coaching companies, please go to my website, tysonfranklin.com, and read through the coaching section. You'll see I've got a model there called the Thriving Podiatry Business Model. And after you read through everything, there's also a link to my online calendar. From there, we can organize a 30-minute Zoom call. We'll have a bit of a talk. I'll explain the Thriving Podiatry Business Model in a bit more detail. And you may find just after that call, that is all you need just to give yourself a little bit of guidance. But if you want to take it further, I can give you more information. So please go to my website, tysonfranklin.com, and I'll look forward to talking to you soon. Okay, let's get back to the interview. I was just thinking about somebody who, like, somebody who's quite lazy on Twitter or somewhere where, because Twitter is an absolute bullying culture. I know it's called X now, but no one knows what yeah. I'm talking about if I say that yet. So Twitter it is. And there was somebody calling herself like future doctor who was asking about things on sarin gas because she was, she was lazy and had an assignment to do. <clears throat> and somebody came on and the guy had his name up there and he identified himself as whichever agency he was working for. And he said, look, you should, Firstly, you should use a capital, but here's some resources. And anyway, she took it really badly and she started giving him hell. And he said, okay, just trying to help. And so she gave him more hell. And he said, look, lady, Google me. I'm an expert on sarin gas, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Did she get upset because he said, use a capital? No, it's like, because he, he said, you need to know these things and these things. And she just wanted it done for her instead of that. But yeah, that probably didn't help. But <laughs> yeah, oh, see, But even for them to say, oh, use a capital, See, that I don't think is necessary because even what's funny is when I see like a destroyer make a comment on Facebook and then they have a pile of spelling mistakes, incorrect grammar, and like I said, you're just going like, and all that kind of, yeah, yeah, you say, wow. Better than instead of mm. than, then, yeah. Oh, yeah, and just where they've obviously typed something and then gone back because they thought, hang on, no. My keyboard skills are better than that. And they type something else, but they've left the extra word, so something doesn't make yeah. any sense. Yeah. And I tell you, nobody dives in and goes, oh, I'd take this more serious if your grammar was better. Mm. Because everyone just knows there's no point because if you then comment, then it just opens up a can. Whereas I had, it was a guy I used to know in Cairns who used to deliberately be in groups, would just sitting, must just be sitting there at night in their underpants, just waiting for someone to pay. This is how I image, this is how I yeah. picture people. They're sitting in front of the computer on Facebook, refresh, <gasps> yeah. I can comment. And they sit there quickly typing away. And then they sit there waiting for a response, <laughs> waiting for someone to go like and say, yeah, yeah, you're awesome. That's very 2023 now, Tyson. Now yeah. you can actually program AI to sit there in its underpants and go like, chat GPT, please insult these people. Like, <laughs> Ah, yes. No, but I think they, they wouldn't get the same pleasure. No, absolutely. Uh, out but, of doing it. But no, it's – what, what did they say? In the old days, you'd write in your diary, you'd get very upset if somebody read it. Nowadays, you put stuff on Facebook and you'd decide, you get really upset if nobody reads it. Like, so. Yeah, it's true. I don't know. I just think if you get to type something, think about the person receiving it, how is it going to make them feel? Is it going to be uplifting or is it going to tear mm -hmm. them down? And oh. if you know it's going to tear them down, even in the slightest way, then don't post it. I once saw somebody wrote, before you say anything, say, first ask yourself two questions. Is it kind and is it true? And if the answer to part one is no, then don't really bother with part two. Yeah, they might um, be thinking that about this podcast. They, they, they <laughs> might, might be going, I mean, yeah, why are you putting this uh, podcast out? Pretty much. You're 25 minutes in. What are you guys going to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it also comes down to the kind of moral clarity we have as what do you want to put out into the world? And in reality, you could sit there and comment on things, but – what, who are you commenting for? Are you commenting for them or are you commenting for you? Because mm. if what, what you get out of it is that you're helping somebody achieve a better outcome or better sense of self-worth or whatever else, by all means, go ahead. But if you're doing it because you feel relevant because now, even though they didn't know you existed, you somehow are the man, okay, great. It's like I heard a thing once where someone said, imagine you had a time machine. You can go back to 1950 and bring someone here. And they said, what can you tell me about 2024? And you said, I've got access in my pocket to something which can 
tell me everything that we currently know. I can look it up within seconds. And I can talk to somebody on the other side of the world. They can see my face. I can see their face in real time. We can hear one another. And we can have a conversation as if we're in the same room, which is topical because I'm sitting in Melbourne, you're up in Cairns. Yeah. But, and they said, that's amazing. What do you mm. use it for? And he said, well, mostly <laughs> I put up pictures of my breakfast and I argue with strangers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I've got a good butt. So I take a lot of butt photos. Oh, fantastic. And, You'll have to send me some. No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking like a, yeah, no, no, somebody no. else on behalf of other people. Okay. But in that I, case, please don't send that. Uh, no, but it, it, it's funny though because when you said that first part, I'm going, yeah, we actually do. We have yeah. the technology here is there's more technology there than what put man on the moon. And you're yeah, like, absolutely. And we all have it in our back pocket. And we, absolutely. We, we use it for but, the dumbest uh, shit. Think, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. There's a great YouTube video where this, this professional cinematographer says in 1969, we had the technology to send a man to the moon and return him safely, but we didn't have the technology to fake it until 1972, and somehow people are missing this. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true, but, but think about how, how fast things change. The Wright brothers, at the end of 1903, flew for 40 metres, 12 seconds. Less than 66 years later, they're landing in the Sea of Tranquility, but 1969. That's crazy. Less than 66 years later, you've gone from this glider with an engine to Apollo 11. And things effort. will ne things will never change that slowly again. No, I, I think back to even like I graduated in eighty eight, and I look at podiatry over that progression, and I'm just like, oh, "Wow, where to go?" Is one thing, mm -hmm. but it's changed. It's changed so much. We have so much access to information. It is mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. That's why it surprised me when some people post things on social media. I'm going. There's a lot of places you could have posted that same question and actually got an yeah. answer. Yeah. With without being ridiculed by somebody. Yeah. Off to my left, I've got this bookcase. Uh, it's got McGlamorys on it and it's got various pod med things and rheumatology and all that kind of stuff. It is the most expensive decoration in this office because yeah. I don't look anything up in there anymore. If I need to know, I will firstly there's a computer right here, or I'll ask somebody, or I'll just gradually learn things but the days of going and needing a reference where you'd look it up and find the paragraph answer and go yes that is a rhabdomyosarcoma no look but god forbid you have actually see one of those but but no it's you don't do that anymore it's totally changed mm. uh, to the point where i'm hoping that what ai will do is get rid of all the mindless essays that you have to write about stuff that you didn't care about and nor did the person marking it because if, if you can just get it done by chat gpt what's the point of doing it just do exams yeah, and that's the part too where when somebody has made a comment and then somebody has made some remarks back and then posted an article or a peer review article or something like that. And like I said, that information is sometimes quite good because yeah. maybe they may not have actually come across that without it, without the prompt. Yeah. But it all but comes back to the, I think, the delivery. The delivery, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this thing, if you have an abundance mentality, you go, you know what, this is a great chance to to put something out there which will help the person. And if that's why you're doing it, then you will give the resource and you will comment and you'll say, hey, I found this. The only downside to that is that I think people get scared of that because the same trolls that would tear down the original poster then st start tearing down the people helping them out. It becomes like a rivalry and they say, oh, we do this and we don't do that. And it's okay for some, but... And again, it's. I think if if you were to look at podiatry's biggest problem, it would be happiness, because in reality, all yeah. the other stuff has lined up. We got we're, we're fine with prescribing rights and ultrasound and all that kind of stuff. What what a real issue is is self image, and I think that can easily be changed if you just turn the switch and go, guys, enjoy what you're doing. If you want to know something, call us, ask us. Do CPD together. I think it would be fantastic if a bunch of smaller clinics in an area just said, look. We're going to do CPD. There are three of us. What's the point putting it on just here? But there are two guys over there. There's one lady over there. There are four over there. Let's all just pick a night, Wednesday in a month's time. We'll get together. We'll host it. We'll get some food. And two of us will do talks. And we'll get our CPD that way. And we'll get together and we'll say, I like that oh, don't, you, don't you hate the fact that Prax Week does this? Or whatever? And I reckon that would be brilliant. And it would foster relationships. And if, they, and if you go, yeah, but that guy is just he's known for being a bit of a Okay, great. We've well, got two options. You can invite them and change that, 
or you can invite them and prove that and not invite them again. Or you can just say, okay, great. We want to work with the people that want to be around us. The sum total of five people you spend most of your time with. So why don't we try and up the average and say, I'll get something from that. And so I mean, a relationship begins with selfishness. It begins with sort of something about that was good enough that I want to do it again. You don't go, geez, I had a really great chat with Tyson. It'd be very good for him if he got to spend more time with me. That's actually not how it works. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, but I, yeah, I, wouldn't have like, a, I wouldn't have a problem with that. There you go. But, but what I'm saying is, if you can get something happening where a bunch of potters will get together and they'll say, you know what, we've all got stuff to learn, but more than anything, just being together with somebody else who's in the same trenches as you are is useful. Therefore, let's all get together. And if it works, you go, great, let's do it again in two months' time. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a weekly thing. You're not dating, but it's at the same time, it also means you can go, oh, geez, you know what, I'm down to podiatrist and I'm now sick. I'll call this crowd and say, guys, can we just put your number on the answering machine? We're going to have to close for the day. I, this lady down there, I messed up royally once and I, I accidentally didn't order more scalpel blades with the usual disposables and I suddenly realized we were down to three. And I realized this at 10 o'clock in the morning, so it wasn't going well. And I called up a lady down the road and she's amazing. She's been practicing since the eighties. I said, hey, can I just borrow a couple? She just said, here you go, gave me two boxes. Wouldn't let yeah. me even buy them from her. She just gave me two boxes of scalpel blades. So she just gave me eighty dollars worth of stuff because I said, "Can I borrow a couple?" Yeah, but um, it's like you said, brought it earlier on about worthy rivals. And do you remember that cartoon where there was the sheepdog and the coyote, um, and sure. the sheepdog looked after the sheep, and at night he guarded the sheep. He just sat there on the hill guarding the sheep, and the coyote would constantly. It was the same coyote from the Roadrunner. Uh, he would be well, it's called recycling. Yeah, recycling. It was a different coyote because what the other one was in Arizona desert. But he would be trying to, constantly trying to get the sheep, digging tunnels under the ground. All the usual things happen in a car, and the sheepdog would just beat the living crap out of him. This would happen the whole car, and all of a sudden, it would be like at the end of his shift, it was like the sheepdog would get his stuff to go and leave, and the coyote would uh, leave at the same time because it's like it was the end of his shift. <laughs> they go, okay, well, that was a fantastic day, wasn't it? Yeah, see you again tomorrow, same time. Yep, not a problem. Right. And I look at that and I think, podiatry, you can still be business rivals. Yeah. But you can still still be business friends and you can be yeah. podiatry friends. And I did a reboot in Cairns recently and the two girls there, Renee and Chloe, they've been friends for years. They work together in Townsville. They've now got clinics on the Sunshine Coast a couple of kilometres from each other. So mm -hmm. they are in direct competition. However, they have maintained and stayed best of friends. That's brilliant. I've got friends Fantastic. in podiatry where we send each other patients. We go, look, we can't see you. I suggest you go there. We know them. They're reputable. They're good. They'll fit you in. They've got more podiatrists than us, so there's a better chance they'll see you. And they get things because our niche is very heavily MSK orthotic. So if their lab doesn't do what they want to do, they'll send it to us and say, look, could you – work your magic on this. Yeah. And that's great. So they keep their patient. They still keep doing their general pod and so on. We do what they sent them to us for. But we don't take the patient and then say, okay, great, you're now ours. We go, okay, cool. We'll talk to your regular podiatrist. We'll do that. We don't make ourselves out as anything special. We just say, okay, this is what we do. This is what they do. All the research says that what you want is someone who does nothing but these two or three things mm. all the time. And this happens to be what we do. And now go back to your podiatrist and see them. And vice versa. I, you've heard Joseph Frankel on the podcast as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mate of mine. He works up the road. There's absolutely no competition. If I have obscure skin stuff and wound stuff, he's brilliant at that. It's not my thing. It doesn't mean that I don't think it's valuable and important that somebody does it, but he loves it and I don't. So, And he's great at it. So why would I not send it to somebody who's an expert if I'm not particularly enamored with having to see it in the first place and he loves it mm. and he's good at it and he's qualified? Great. Go there. Um, same time, we like we have uh, we have an orthotic lab on site. We do almost nothing but this is our thing. So if if your mod route with the Kirby Sky is not doing with the patient, and you think there's something more that could be done, send them down here. In fact, come with. Mm. I've had podiatrists come down with their patients, and physios come down with their patients just like a watch, and then we've shown them how we do things, and maybe we'll never see anything from them again. They'll go back and do it themselves, but that's fine too. Um, yeah, that's it's it. Every, it's everybody helping everyone. Solid. Yeah. But it's like you said before about becoming a happy podiatrist. I've got this five-step uh, diagram that I use, and when I'm 
in different talks, I always say that everybody starts out as an ambitious student. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to do podiatry. Yes. These are the ones that chose to do podiatry. I'm going to be a podiatrist. And then they graduate and they're an optimistic graduate. The, the world is their oyster. Yeah, they've yeah, been I'm listening. Sure that, but... Yeah, they've been listening to the Podiatry Legends podcast all the way through uni because there's enough episodes there now to keep them all entertained. And the amount of emails I get from students who tell me that this podcast has kept them in the profession and has got them so fired up about graduating is fantastic. So keep sending me emails. Tyson at podiatrylegends.com. Anyway, then level three is at some stage, it could be in the first year, it might be 10 years, but they will become what I call a frustrated clinician. Everybody gets frustrated. It's like, oh, is this really what I want to do? Or I'm not making the money I want to make. It could be some form of frustration. And the level four is becoming a happy podiatrist. And level five, though, is having a thriving podiatry career, whatever that means to you. So thriving podiatry career to one person might be money, another person might be a number of clinics, somebody else might be being the having the best position working for somebody else. But what I tell everyone is you can't go from frustrated clinician to thriving career until you become a happy podiatrist. You've got to find... Yeah. It's a continuum. Yeah, you've got to find and what then... <laughs> makes you happy. And if you don't find that, you will always be frustrated. Mm. The other thing is that your progress to get through those things, if there's something blocking you, your response to it can't be linear. Like, for example, like Ray Dalio has got a great book called Principles. It's very heavy on things because there's a lot of data in it, like a lot of content. But it's uh, he, he went from going, I know I'm right, to how do I know I'm right? And they did mm. weird things like they have baseball cards at Bridgewater where they, they talk about characteristics of a person and they use their Myers-Briggs type and all that kind of thing. And so that's how they match who would be good for a certain role and who would be easier to work with certain types of people than others and so on. And it's the same. I, I had people down the road and I was much more experienced. I was much more qualified and they were busier and I'm going, but I'm better at this stuff than them. How are they getting busy? Because what I didn't know was that what I knew about podiatry, they were putting into marketing. They were putting mm. into pay-per-click. They were doing all those things, which nowadays everyone does again in the next frontier will be somewhere else but oh, they... I, have, I have lots of ideas I'm, oh, I'm, oh. I'm always always looking for different ways Absolutely. To just because things like you said you do something and then everybody else catches up yeah and therefore you've got to do the next thing so it's like the whole the yeah. if everybody's doing paper click then you've got to do something else yeah. you drive through melbourne and there are certain suburbs which are quite industrial and what they were was that was the periphery of where people lived and so you could afford land to put up warehouse shells and then the suburbs expanded further, and so they passed them, and you get to the next concentric circle where there was the periphery then, and then it expands again. So you go through certain areas like Moorabbin here, and there's a whole lot of that kind of stuff, DFO outlets and all that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, and then you've got houses again and, and business districts, and, that, and it just keeps going. Same thing. But when I was saying it can't be linear, in order to get from stage one to stage two to stage three, if there's something blocking you, you've actually got to step to the side for a bit and go, well, what's getting in the way? What don't I know? Because presumably you know how to do everything that got you to that level. And you know, it's like getting promoted to the level of incompetence. You, you can't do any further. So you stay at the one you got promoted to. Mm. In order to progress, you've got to change what you're competent at. You've got to change the way that you look at it and say, if I'm not as busy and I'm good at what I do, and the people that come here are happy, what's stopping other people from knowing I'm here? What's And you, you pretty quickly figure out that the only people that know you're good at things are the ones who are already in the office. Okay, maybe I need to learn something about how to get them in the office. Then I can do my stuff. Maybe it's something about my support team where they're doing something about the patient experience, which we didn't know. And we've been very systematic on how we do that. And now I get much better compliments for the, the support staff than I ever do about my work. <laughs> like they all love them. Like yeah. They're making coffees and getting happy socks and ch using the charging station and all that kind of stuff because we want it to be unclunky and friendly and unthreatening. Like we don't have anatomy posters up anywhere either because that's not our thing. No. But, we, but there's always going to be something you can learn and the places you'll learn it from are totally different. Like, I mean, the, I, I still need to read Be Our Guest, the Disney book that you mentioned. Oh, that's a fantastic um, book. Yeah, I'm going to pick that up later. Uh, quite literally, but it's 
there are so many things that are being done well, like Delivering Happiness by Tony Shah, the guy from Zappos. Yeah. He has this thing where he was just trying to sell shoes. But in order to do that, he realized that he had to get rid of all the clunky bits that were making people not want to buy from him when they could just go and buy from any shoe shop. So their customer service was what they played on. And he would he was known for doing things like he would call his company in front of journalists without them knowing it was him calling and he would try to do something weird like ordering a pizza and the guy wouldn't say look mate we're a shoe company go away he'd say look that's not what we do but listen if you want whereabouts do you live okay i see you're in like you're in Cairns. okay i'm just looking around on, on my computer here and i see that there are four pizza places around here two of them deliver if you want why don't i talk you through i can order it from this side if you give me your details i'll put your card in and order it for you and they'll send it to you directly. And this guy would help him order a pizza yeah. because it was, and it was just the taking care of what their needs were paid dividends. Now, very few people actually rang them for that, but at the same time, it was about spending more time on the phone with the person so they had a human connection rather than spending more time on a hole waiting for the next number to push. Um, yeah, well, a friend, a friend of mine, Jesse Green, who's a dentist, and he took a group of dentists over the States. They went to Zappos, they went to Disney University, and they also oh, yeah. went to the Fish Market in Seattle. And it was episode 299, and it was called Behind the Magic, a look inside Disney, Zappos, and more. And one of the down. things he mentioned in that episode was just happiness how that was such an important part of everything that they actually did and also just creating magic with everything that they did mm. it wasn't they weren't just selling shoes they weren't just a theme park they're not just selling yeah. fish at a fish market there was so much more behind it yeah we can i it's not a plug but can i tell you some of the stuff we do i did a workshop with a guy called peter Merritt who talks about wonder. And it was full of all these little things that are behind the scenes, like he was running a country hotel in the UK. And what would happen is the person taking your bags would look at the name tag and radio ahead. So when they, when you got into reception to check in, they knew who was coming. They say, hi, Tyson, welcome to the such and such. And all these little things that, that you didn't expect, but which just gave you that little oxytocin rush. A bit like Will Gadera was talking about when it doesn't even have to happen to you, but if you yeah. see it happening to somebody else, you also feel good about it. And so we started doing little things like we, my accountant a couple of years ago said, you're a podiatry practice. How do you spend a couple of grand a year on lint balls? And it's quite simple. Come uh, here. On what, what balls? The chocolates. Lint. Oh, lint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I, okay. I thought you said something else. I thought uh, you said uh, lip balls, and I'm going, I don't know what a lip ball is, but how do you use a couple of thousand neither. dollars on lip balls? But anyway, yeah, I, I lint, know, but lint chocolate balls. It. Yeah, exactly. Love it's them. quite simple. So we've got, you get orthotics from us, and because we make our own, we've got the milling machine and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So obviously, what do you do with them then? Everybody else has a fancy bag. So we, we and so it's like a little Lululemon bag with our branding on it and that, and we put the orthotics in, and we put, nice shape of instructions in that we did up on Canva and all this. Stuff. And then everybody gets three totally different colored lint balls in there. So when you're opening it and you're going through, all of a sudden there are chocolates and it could just be a caramello, but they don't look the same. So you get these yeah. opulent looking things and they're going, oh, cool. I didn't expect that. And you can either have all three or you can share one with someone, but it's just a little thing that you didn't expect, which will go, okay, cool, because you're getting orthotics. What's that got to do with chocolate? And so we're not, it's not overdone. We're not giving them a whole bunch of gifts and freebies and yeah. that, but it's just a little thing at the end of it, at the end of the experience that just puts the frosting on something that's already, like by the time they even see that, they're usually out of the office. So but this is where, experience. But this is where getting together with, like you said before, <laughs> where podiatrists getting together and just small groups sharing information with each other. Nobody trying to yeah, be yeah. dominant over the other people or say, hey, look how yeah. awesome I am, or I'm super intelligent. I know where all the articles are buried yeah. so I can drag them out and actually work together. But there's one more, there's one more aspect of that I actually want to clarify because I did this with – because whenever we bring staff through and we show them how we do this, because we have another thing, we give them some happy socks at the beginning, which has got a sticker saying, welcome to the Loyal and Clinic, thanks for choosing us, which we put on there. We just give them to people. It's another thing the accountant asked me about. It's not a sales gimmick, and I'll tell you why. This only goes to people that are already here. They've already chosen us. They're not yeah. choosing us because we're trying to offer them and come here and get a free pair of socks. They come in, and the socks wasn't my idea. Someone else showed me that. So anybody who's listening, feel free to use it. Uh, I'll even tell you where I buy them. But 
the truth is that these are people that are already there. We've minimized the risk on the website. They've come in. They've already decided they're going to book in with us. The first time they come in, we go, look, thanks for coming in. Just as a welcome to the clinic present, here, choose. Do you want octopus? Do you want swordfish? Do you want pizza? And there's a whole array. And you go, okay, cool. Enjoy. It's just one extra little thing which will set them up to be more comfortable and happier here, which means they're going to be more forthcoming with their information, which means we're going to be able to develop more of a rapport with them, which means we can treat them, which means they will get a better result. We'll be able to fix the problem and we can actually give them better care because we gave them some socks. And in, you know what's important is the person with a scarcity mentality hmm. won't do that. Yeah. Because if you have a scarcity mentality thinking everyone's trying to take your patients, hmm. one, you're going to keep to yourself. You're not going to want to associate with other people a lot. You're not going to want to share ideas, but you'll be scared to part with your money for socks. Yeah for chocolate, because yeah. you're thinking, oh, but if I spend that, I may not have it for something else. The truth, the truth is, look, as a business owner, you've got to know your numbers. As a business owner, you've got to be lean where you can be so that you can spend it on the other indulgences that will augment the patient experience. But the truth is, like, for us, we get them wholesale. We source them beforehand. One of my, one of my staff, who is now a podiatrist on the other side of Melbourne, did a great job, found a great supplier, good quality, good price. So it's like four ninety five instead of twenty. Yeah. If five dollars on the cost of your treatment as a once off is a stretch, then you're possibly doing something wrong with your treatment in the first place. I'm not saying you should skimp on the actual treatment bit, but if you are undercharging to the level where you can't work five dollars into the treatment as a once off, when you consider the cost per acquisition to the patient and the lifetime value of the patient who might get orthotics every four years and who might come in for general care in between and might send three family members, all of whom will bring two other people, then you're right. You probably shouldn't spend the five dollars. But um, <laughs> well, we used to have a fridge set up in a reception area with a big glass door on it. Mm -hmm. And it was full of water bottles, but they were all logoed water bottles, Pro Arch Podiatry, keeping you hydrated since 1992. Oh, yeah. And when patients arrive, we'd say to them, you, look, as soon as they arrive, if you want a uh, bottle of water, just grab one now. Yeah. And when they're leaving, hey, grab another bottle if you want. These are the cost us. By the time we got the water delivered, labels put on, printed, yeah. it still only worked out yeah. like 80 cents a bottle. Yeah, I, I've, I mean, I tell patients, if you're passing and you want to grab a coffee, you don't have to be coming here for an appointment. Just come in, use the coffee machine. They're coming into the clinic. They remember yeah. that. They tell other people. We actually chose not to get branded socks, and I'll tell you why. If I give you socks saying the lower limb clinic, maybe you'll wear them to go for a run. If I give you socks that have got hamburgers on them, people go, oh, cool socks. And you go, thanks, my podiatrist gave them to me. Oh, who's your podiatrist? Like, nobody's going to care if they wear socks with my livery on them, but they will look at something else that actually may choose to wear out. I do have some hamburger socks. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever come to Melbourne, I'll give you some more. Okay. I'm just looking at the time. We've got to, we've got to start wrapping up. Oh, actually, we've both got a meeting. We've both got meetings straight after That's this. Right. So any final words before we wrap up that you'd like to finish on? Look, it's rare for me to give a call to action on a podcast. Um, I'll do it anyway. Oh, yeah. You know what? I reckon two things. First of all, if you reckon that there are people out there that, that you could get along with and the only thing that means that you're not having any sort of relationship with them is that they're working in the same profession but they're in a different office, give them a call one day and say, hey, just wondering, we work down the road, we don't know each other, but just reaching out to see if you guys want to grab a cup of coffee, maybe we can do some CPD together. And I reckon they probably wouldn't say no to having lunch one day and just chilling and shooting the breeze there probably won't be anything financial that comes out of mm. it but at the same time you'll have a tribe you'll have a cohort of people you can chat to and just go oh geez are you quiet at the moment yeah me too like that kind of thing makes you feel better it does so you can share your troubles and at the same time if there are people out there that are asking for help if they've had the guts to actually put something up on the internet or they've asked you a question or whatever it's not a it's not a clarion call for you to show how good you are. If they're asking you, they already think you know something, and hopefully they're not asking just because they want to get everyone's opinion. Because that in itself can be disrespectful. But if you have someone asking, if they're asking on the internet, whether you know them or not, just be kind, encourage, and even if the information is correct, it can still come out in a way that's damaging. More than anything. Try and do it in a way where you're delivering a message that the person comes away thinking, oh, good, I'm glad I asked that. I'll do it again. Mm. 
and there will be somebody watching who didn't have the guts to post who might do it next time because they didn't get publicly lynched just because they asked for help. <laughs> that, huh? that That is so true. And just on that point you said about getting together with people in your town, I went to a particular place down south a couple of weeks back and to go and do an on-site training day just with the whole team. And while I was there, there were two other people that I knew that had both done my reboot at different times. So I thought, I've got a spare evening. I like hamburgers. I'm going to pull the three of them together and see if they want to have a hamburger with me. And they all did. And we had a fantastic night together. And what I loved the most was that they didn't know each other, which was great, but they were all exchanging business cards with each other at the end. Mm -hmm. And since then, they've sent the occasional email backwards and forwards, and they're, they're going to stay in touch. And I think that is what the podiatry profession needs, is mm -hmm. people connecting, reaching out to each other. And like you said, if you don't know them, reach out to them and have a coffee. Try and get some more of them, more of yours together and try and be like uplifting and motivational to each other I agree. as well. See, I, I do that on an international scale. Like I, it's rare for me to travel to another country where I don't, catch up and have a meal with another podiatrist, which is oh, kind of weird. Yeah, I yeah. do that all the time. But, I mean, um, years ago I had a lady come. I have all these people, just to finish off, they, they come to Melbourne to visit their kids from places like Johannesburg, and then they go back there after a couple of months. So I had one lady who went to see Sean Pinkus, who's been on the podcast, yeah. and she was leaving the next day and he said, you need to go and see someone, go to Melbourne. So she insisted that I should tell him what was going on so he could make the call. I sent him an email and said, yeah, Hey, I've got this lady. Apparently, I'm a podiatrist in Melbourne. Anyway, he said, "Yeah, I'm sure we got the same diagnosis." Anyway, nine months later, I happened to be going there, and I reached out and said, "Do you want to grab a cup of coffee? I'm going to be in Johannesburg." Said, yeah, okay, cool. By the end of that, we were like good mates to the point whereby a couple of years ago, there was a machine I was thinking of buying. He had one. I'd never seen one in Melbourne because there weren't any in Melbourne. And he said, "Look, why don't you come here for a week? We'll put you in the lab. By the end of it, you'll be competent." So I said, "All right." And I wound up just going and working with his crew in Cape Town for, because by then he'd moved, for a whole week just because we'd built that relationship because we had a chat. Mm. Uh, and this happened around the world. I've got a whole bunch of people in that category that I'm in contact with constantly because we all just value having connection with each, with yeah. each other. That's where the podcast they... helps me, though, because yeah. I have so many people from around the world on the podcast that yeah. when I'm in their country... I let them know that I'm there, and it is, oh, fan yeah. it is fantastic catching up. But we've gone to you know, NFL games you know, oh, yeah. in the States and caught up. We've gone out for dinner with reps. And yeah, when I've been in the UK, which I'm planning to go back to the UK in 2025, fantastic. which should be fun, catch yeah. up with all the people uh, that have been listening to the podcast I as well. I've got a photograph of me on the foothills of Table Mountain wearing my Legends T-shirt with Sean. Oh, I yes. did see that. Yeah, that's good. But and again, it's, uh, it's it it does beg the question, and I'll end with this. But like, why is it so easy to reach out to a podiatrist in upstate New York or South Africa or Israel, but not in Melbourne? Because you're scary, Richard. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I think... That's why you don't put the video up. No, I, the video's going up. I think... People are used to me now. It, it is. Yeah, you go, what, the video's going up? That means I had to wear clothes this whole time. Yes. You were supposed I've only to. got the scrub top on. But anyway, yeah, I know every time you stand up, it's terrible. But I don't know why it's been that way where in your own area, everyone... They don't want to associate with people in their own area. But those that don't know who do it really benefit from it. So I think hopefully after people listen to this, one, they're going to be kinder to each other on social media mm. and they're going to reach out to people in their area and there's going to be a lot of cups of coffee. Drunk. Yes, it so just a request, if somebody does ring me in the next three weeks, just start off by saying, hey, I heard you on the podcast because that way at least I won't wonder. Like, yeah, oh, don't just say that. Just say, I heard you on my favourite podcast, the Podiatry Legends podcast, and then Richard will go, ah, oh, okay, then I know you're right. a good guy That's or right. girl. Yeah. Great, what did you like about the episode? Yeah, don't Tyson. ask too many Tyson. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Richard, we better wrap this up. This Thanks has been fantastic talking with you again. Uh, always enjoy our conversations, and I'll talk to you again very soon. Look forward to it. Have a good one.